Hello, nice to talk to you again. Um, I'm in a bit of a strange location this time um, and enjoying a, a very nice cup of Indian green tea from Tamil Nadu called Dragon Well green tea. It's quite nice. Very important to get the right water though. It's going to be high magnesium content. Um, I think a lot of you know I'm a bit of a tea fan. So I usually start my day with a Japanese sencha. Um, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Then move on to oolongs through the day. Anyway, obsessive personality types. Um, speaking of obsessive personality types, my dad made this chair. Um, uh, very splendid it is too. So I haven't been with you for a while and I'm in a strange location because we decided to build a recording studio in our basement. Um, it's quite a big thing, quite a grand uh, affair and we got so many quotes that were uh, beyond grand. They were enormous. They were monstrous. Welcome to Switzerland. So my wife in her infinite wisdom decided uh, let's build our own. So that's what we've been doing and uh, really happy with it. It should be up and running pretty soon. See what I miss when I do these podcasts is I don't have a like a permanent microphone set up. We've got amazing microphone set up now. Thank you, Christian Lindbergh. Uh, thank you, Per Eglund, for your amazing advice. So we're all set up now to record that I can say, you know, what I really mean is and pick up the trombone and just play a couple of examples, like things to practice. Particularly in relation to this podcast, it would be quite useful. Can't do it now. But I didn't want to miss the opportunity to do this podcast because it's on matters that are quite... Um, important to me at the moment. I've been talking to them, talking about them quite a lot. The first one, the first subject is about my uncle's blacksmith shop. My uncle is now 81, um, was an incredibly hard-working farmer all of his life. Cricket fan and a big influence on me when I was a kid. Very fine man. And um, his first profession that he learned was as a blacksmith, as in making horseshoes and iron fences and that sort of thing. And on the farm, the, the, uh, the blacksmith shop, the smithy, is still there. It's uh, about 200 years old. It's all covered and used as a storeroom now. They've piled all kinds of nonsense in there. But he still knows what he's doing. And um, until quite recently, around the end of August, beginning of September, some local panicked farmer would come bounding and say, you've got to help me, you've got to help me. My combine harvester, which probably cost about 300,000 pounds, who knows, um, computer, you know, programmed, um, is broken. And it's going to take three weeks to get the spare part. But I need to harvest today or tomorrow because it's going to rain. I've got a thousand acres or whatever of barley or wheat and my combine harvester is broken. I can't borrow anybody else's because they're all using theirs too. Please help me. And so they come with the broken part. My uncle had said, well, let's have a look at it and measure it up and fire up the furnace, you know, get it going and get on the anvil and measure this and put a screw thread in it and go, there you go. Yeah, that should work now. That should be all right. He's certainly okay until your spare part arrives in three weeks. And it occurs to me <clears throat> that all I'm doing when I practice is building spare parts and putting patches on things that are broken or not working. And I see it's a deficiency in um, students, students who want to have a practice regime, a routine. Sure, those things are great. But and they're going to get you 95% of the way. Let's, let's face it, you know, there's lots of good methods out there, method books and scales and flexibilities. And all. But I very often say to people, <clears throat> they'll play a piece through and there'll be a, just a, a, one measure, two measures. It's like, does that happen every time you play? Ah, uh, well, uh, three times out of five. Okay, really, and what's the spare part? What's the etude that you've built? What's... What's that little patch that you're going to put over there? And I realized <coughs> that 
One of the biggest skills that we need to develop to become an advanced musician, advanced instrumentalist, is the ability to build our own spare parts. Because there's nobody like you. Nobody on the face of the earth has lived your life, has got your teeth structure, has your fantasy, your imagination, your development, your evolution. So the Arban, La Fosse, Etude books, Bordoni's, Blazevich, whatever, they're all very much blunt instruments. They will get you a certain way down the road. Some people further than others. They're good, not speaking against them. But for the ultimate, building your own patches, building your own spare parts, you need to be able to create your own exercises, your own etudes. Like I say, when I've got this recording studio more up and running, I'll show you how I build mine. And sometimes they're only three or four notes. I'll say to students, when you go from that note to that note, do you always miss the one in the middle? Or rather, I've noticed you do tend to. Would you like to talk about this? Why is this happening? Are there musical approaches that we can take to fix it? Um, actually, I intend doing a, a podcast soon by, um, no, based on something I've heard from Professor um, Penrose, who is like Oxford University, but dealing with which part of the brain controls what. And the area that deals with brilliance is unconscious, cerebellum. So that, as far as teaching, performing, playing is concerned, is really an interesting thing. That's going to get a full podcast. So, you know, oboe players, double reed players, bassoon players, um, they have to make their own reeds. And they just sit in rehearsals, you know, you know, and they're scraping away. We've all seen them doing it, you know. Um, drives them crazy, you know, the back pressure. Not good for them. You know, they're scraping away. And if they give that read to anybody else to try, they're like, that's awful. That's terrible, you can't play on that stuff. No, he's built and designed exactly just for that person. Um, and that's how we need to build our little etudes. Okay, try this patch here. Um, and you just repeat it over and over and over again. I did a recital last year in Jerusalem and I was staying in some kind of kind of sort of um, artist's commune stroke hotel or whatever that's on the um, on the old town old city walls beautiful place and in the next room was one of the world's most famous violinists who's going to do a recital I think the night before I did and um, the insulation in the rooms was not great and every morning at you know, 7.45, 8 o'clock, he'd start playing these four measures. It was a bark, it was a bark, partita. He played those four measures for 45 minutes until I couldn't stand it anymore and I went out. And the next morning he did the same thing. Fortunately that night he had, um, he had the recital. Four measures, 45 minutes, slower, faster, different rhythms, different dynamics, different musical approaches. And I, I did a concert also last year, and I was cool with it, it was fine. I knew it was all gonna be okay. But again, I was three, four measures, they were gonna get me. They were gonna bring me down. I was gonna fall on my backside and Again, my wife, again, says, how can you do this? For the two weeks before, all I practiced was those four measures. I knew that in practicing them, they were, you know, I was going to get a reasonable amount of stamina and I could play the rest of the program without any issues. And I just played those four measures over and over and over again. And there were four measures that maybe you wouldn't find difficult. In fact, yeah, I'm sure you wouldn't, but I did. We've all got our little Achilles heels, things that we find tough. That's why applying standard methods of practice 
to everybody doesn't work. You need to build the handmade spare part. And now, okay, granted, obsessive personality, obsessive personality type, practicing four measures for two weeks is a bit extreme. And when it came to the concert, I got those four measures right. And I was probably the only person in the whole room who was happy about it. No one else even noticed it. <laughs> <coughs> but I guess that's part of reaching a high level. Um, and so, back to the oboe, back to the double reach. You know, they make this and so it works for them. Now when, let's say for example, that situation, if you're going from a low note to a high note, you've got one in between, you always missed it. It's opening a can of worms. Why do you always miss that? What etude are we going to do? What spare part? And then it's like, hmm, do I need to ch change, do I need to do a spare part or am I doing something wrong? These are the questions that you have to ask yourself. You know, like when you buy a, buy a fridge, you're troubleshooting the back, you know. My fridge is not working. Have you plugged the fridge in? Yes or no? Yes. Is it working? No. Is the light on? No. Have you turned the fridge on? No. Turn the fridge on. Is your fridge working? Yes. <laughs> Those really ridiculous things. Like, I can't go from here to here. I'm doing an etude. I'm going to build exercise. I'm going to work on the breathing. Da, 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 da. Am I doing something technically wrong? I'm going to talk to my teacher. That's how it works. Um, by the way, mentioning that thing about um, breathing. There's always, you know, if you ask standard conventional wisdom, I can't play that fast passage. I'll just keep the air going through. Ah. If it's struggling in the higher register, I'll make sure the air's going through. No. No. That's a bit of a cop-out. Actually, if you're struggling to play something fast and you drive the air through more, it's going to make it more difficult. But that's another podcast. They're going to come later when I've got my studio set up. However, working on our breathing, making sure that our breathing is working when we... and then releasing. And we play just working and releasing. If we don't have that there, if we don't have that basic setup in place, nothing else we do technically will make as big a difference as it would do if that was correct. So, level one, I'm having trouble with my high register. Just check out my breathing, okay? Is it working? Can't play fast. Just check. Flexibilities. Am I breathing okay? The first thing you think of, always. You know, I just did, um, and I'm not saying I get it right. I just did a concert in a church with a couple of my very fine students and it was to kind of resurrect an oratorio for a flute, three trombones, percussion and choir. And uh, it was nine o'clock in the morning, church service. And one is reminded of how unpleasant it is to play at nine o'clock in the morning. And it was broken into two halves and I was thinking, yeah, you know, lots of nasty entries. I'm thinking, uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe uh, yeah, playing in the morning is difficult. And then oh, in the break, it was sort of like 10 minutes off before we play the next part. I thought, how am I breathing? And then I thought, oh yeah, it's easy now, isn't it? <laughs> 60 years old, I still make the same mistakes you do. So learning how to build your etudes is something. Learning how to build your little patches, learning how to build your spare parts. Um, I'm going to go on to something now which I call building your Swiss army knife, seeing as I am on Swiss soil at the moment. The Swiss army knife are famous for being indestructible and very, very practical, very, very useful. You practice, you work hard, you're conscientious, you study, you listen to repertoire, you get the best information. You strive. You get a job. Woohoo! But that's only the beginning. Surviving in the job is a difficult thing. 
Everyone sees winning a job as being the end game, the finishing line. It's not. It's the starting. You get the honour to stand in the starting line. It's not the finish. The finish is when you retire and your playing is still healthy. <laughs> the finish line has lots of obstacles. Like you can't practice. There's a school of teaching which was quite successful in, in Europe, in Germany. It's based on doing six, eight hours practice a day. Great, fine, you know. Your Aunt Gladys will win a job if she practices eight hours a day. Um, but what happens when you're married, when you've got kids screaming at three o'clock in the morning, uh, when you've been off on maternity leave and, you know, what are you going to do then? What are you going to do when you're getting divorced? What are you going to do when you've got kids to take to school? What are you going to do when you've got other things that are important to you in your life or interesting in your life or other goals or other dreams or other hobbies and you can't practice six hours a day or you're on tour or you've got a load of work? You're playing might fall to pieces and actually that has happened to a lot of people from that school. Um, so we need to, I always say to my students, 40 minutes. This is after they've won a job. 40 minutes. You should be able to survive the rest of your career on 40 minutes practice a day. I recommend you do more. But in a fallback situation, you need to be able to build your Swiss army knife indestructible basic technique. You build your own practice routine, build your own practice regime. I help students do this. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do I could tell you what mine is, but um, would you like to borrow my shoes? The shirt? It's not going to fit, I'm different. I need a different practice regime to the one that you do. Okay, it's going to have some basic stuff in it. First of all, I'm going to work on relaxing my breath, working to take the air and relaxing to release it. Just moving around the register and feeling how great it is to create a vibration and the legato is really wonderful and all of this. And I love making a sound on the trombone. Yes, scales. I've said this so many times before. If I have 20 minutes to practice in a day, I'll play, play scales and arpeggios in broken form. That's it. Sorry to be boring. That's what I'll do. And I have the same two, three etudes that I've been playing now for 46 years. Almost every day. Almost all of them every day. Because on this one, I work on my legato and my slide technique. And it's going back to what I know. This one, I work on my articulation. You know, you see, well, it's like, this is where I fix this. This is where I, and it's re-establishing what I do every day on the basic etudes. And I have I play hardly any. Like I say, there's loads of good books out there. I play a very limited number. Apart from the handmade ones that I was talking about earlier, which change depending on what I'm playing. But at the moment, I haven't had too much time to practice. <clears throat> and so uh, I'm having to confront my killer. If you go and study with somebody and you think it's in this way, of, in this sort of education has become consumerist. I am the customer, I'll go and study with this person and this person will do this for me and teach me this and this will happen. No, you do it. We don't. We guide you. One thing money can't buy Hard work uh, and a smart approach. Can't buy that. Um, you think you're going to go to someone and they're going to fix all your problems for you. Well, first of all, they aren't going to fix them. But secondly, you expect them to show you how to fix all your problems. Okay, yeah, okay, got that. Fine. But if someone turns up and presents 10 different issues that need some form of resolution. I think eight of them go pretty quickly and they're usually linked to one particular technical aspect that's off, out of kilter, not right. And so you're going to shoot eight of them down pretty quickly in the first three months. 
um, three to six months. And then after that, there's one that's going to be a bit sticky, but it'll get better. But there's one that ain't going anywhere. You're never going to fix it. It's never going to go. And that's the same with everybody. You name me your trombone player of choice, I'll tell you what they're fighting with for the rest of their life. Um, we all have it. Mine is the embouchure break. I have an embouchure break. That's my killer. If I don't deal with that on a daily basis, it's going to get me. And I hear so often professional players coming to me and saying, oh, I've got problems, I can't play, I've got time off, and you know, and I've got time off to fix things. And I know I never used to think about it and it was fine and then it stopped working. And in some cases, like, that was always there. He just came and got you in the end. And so when you're building your Swiss Army knife, it's important to realize these are the ones I need for basic maintenance. These are the ones to remind me of how I play the trombone. These are the ones how I cover my basics. And this is the one that I need to look at every day. Otherwise, he's going to come and get me. We all have it. Don't worry. We all have it. Hate to break it to you. It ain't going anywhere. It's going to be there. And I think that's the beauty. I think that's the lovely thing about playing the trombone, I think if it was all totally easy, I don't know, I think we'd find it boring. You know that challenge of um, the little bit of danger when you do a concert. My son, bless him, 11, just played his first concert last night. Um, played some difficult stuff, first time he'd ever played. Lots of other good young players playing, and quite a big audience. And it was interesting to see him confront danger for the first time. And last night he was kind of a little bit like, what the heck happened? And this morning was kind of like, yeah, that was pretty dangerous. That was quite cool, you know? So then it's like, now you see how you have to practice to cover those, you know, <laughs> make sure it's not as dangerous, you know? <laughs> so with me, it's the embouchure break. Uh, and if you don't know what an embouchure break is, don't find out. You don't need one. Um, and it's something that happened to me when I was about 14 years old, and it gave me this turbo high register. So on the one hand, it's what's paid for all of this, and on the other hand, it's what's paid for all of this lack of grey hair and going bald. <laughs> I've spent most of my life, most of my practice, trying to fix uh, my armature break. And do you know what I can if, in, to all intents and purposes, I have. But... Just a bit of advice, perhaps bordering on a warning. If you have a problem, and you're like me, say, I'm going to get this, I'm going down, I'm going to break you, I'm going to work out to do this. It grows two heads, and then it grows three, and it gets bigger, and it doesn't go. The more you try and fight it, the bigger it's going to grow. Like your mom says, you know, don't scratch it, you're going to make it worse. So with me now, the attitude that I take, and I encourage with my students is, you're there. I know you're there. I know you're going to be there. I accept you. Part of my life, I'm not going to try and kill you. I'm just going to try and flagen is the German word. I'm just going to try and care for you every day. Make sure that you're where you're should, you should be and I'm where I should be. Not letting the danger grow too close to you. And that's really advice for professional players. Recognize your killer and don't let it grow too close to you. Um, but of course, within that, we have to uh, work out which is, which is the one, which is the Achilles heel. I'm just going to put my cup down. And so that you do in combination with a, with a teacher. By the way, just going back, I was made aware recently of somebody um, who teaches embouchure breaks. In fact, gave a lecture on like five different, how to use five different embouchures. That guy is either very foolish or an absolute utter genius. And judging by some of the mayhem that I'm seeing following that, it is dangerous. It's dangerous. To teach an embouchure break is dangerous. And... It's not something that I recommend teachers do. 
Um, yes, it's how I play. Yes, it's what I do. But I think if I had my time again, I'd like to have found a different way of doing it. There are two established, well-known players who I've taught exactly my own should break to because they were struggling so much in the high register or they were struggling to get the turbo high register that um, I said, look, this is what I do. You like with a packet of cigarettes, comes with a government health warning. This is what I do. This is how I do it. When you breathe, you move like this. And it's worked for them. But they, like me, have to be careful with crossovers. And I can go from the bottom of the register to the top of the register with pretty much two setups. So I've, to all intents and purposes, eradicated my armature break. But once you have something like that, it's always there. That's what I've discovered. So we have to work out what the issue is that we need to fix and we need to um, then work out whether it's us or whether it's the equipment. Uh, I'm not here to sell your equipment. You know I don't do that. I find it very demeaning. Lack of integrity. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk about Christian Griego. And Christian had lessons with me 27 years ago. Uh, he played well. He played well. I don't think anybody, <laughs> least of all Christian, realized which direction his life was going to go in at that point. And um, obsessive personality type, you know, fascinated with everything, wants to know how it all works. And he said that if Christian, Christian Grego of today had been around when he was a kid. He wouldn't be an instrument designer now, he'd be a professional player. Because there's the equipment available to us that we didn't used to have. You know, in the 80s, it was like Con 88H, Bark 42, Bark 5G, Dennis Wick 5L, or <gasps> a Shulky 51. You know, it was like, that was kind of like the choice we had. Now, it, things from so many different makers have developed in so many different ways that, you know, we can find exactly the I mean, the mouthpiece that I play, I've got hundreds of mouthpieces. This one I've been on for 10 years. I keep trying to change because I want to make life more interesting or dangerous. But I keep, but it works for me. And we've got to find out which of those individual pieces of equipment work for you. You know what? I've had, I've had two revelations in my, you know, in my teaching room in the last two or three months. One is, very occasion. I hardly ever talk to my students about equipment. You know, I like them to find what works for them. I encourage them to try different things, but to say, you should play on this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's beyond my pay grade. I can't do that. Um, that's for someone like Crystal. And Every now and then it's like, oh, I've tried this, I've tried this, and it's not working. I get a box of mouthpieces out, and it's kind of like a broad spectrum of different pieces of equipment. Try this. No, 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 no. Try this. Oof, no. Well, that's not so bad. Try this. And then there was one person played. Like, what? That one? And you just, wow. It's an instrument, it's a mouthpiece. But I think he's like, it's a design fault. It doesn't work. It's like based on the 1930s technology. But it changed that student's life. The improvement was unbelievable. And then there was another one where I thought, hmm, the only way I'm going to solve this, I'm going to try and solve it musically, or I'm going to have to go technical. All right, get the box of mouthpieces out. And they were all awful, apart from one. Actually, that was a career go. Three, E, I think it was. I can't play it, I, you know, not my kind of thing. But hey, wanna try my shoes? They don't smell, won't fit you though. Got funny shaped feet. So, the, you know, working out, you've gotta go through to find the right piece of equipment for you to understand what's you and what's the instrument. Because there are some things that'll just, Change the equipment and bang, you got it. But you be careful you don't lose something else while you do it. Just on that matter of equipment, 
Let's go through the most important pieces of equipment. One, the player. One, the most important piece of equipment. The development, all the rest of it, other podcasts, listening to music, getting the right information, practicing, diet, exercise, all the rest of that. One, most important, and that's like the big one. Next thing, mouthpiece. Mouthpiece is the next thing. The further away you move from the source, the less important the equipment is. So if you're making a recording, one, mouthpiece, lead pipe, uh, uh, slide bar, tuning slide, bell, microphone, acoustic, recording software. It all moves further away. This is the most important piece of equipment that you have. Next is the mouthpiece and then the lead pipe. And I would really love to dispel this crazy myth that students are, oh, I prefer this bell. With this. It, that is, you know, these people who spend $6,000, in some cases, on state-of-the-art equipment, and they put a $60 mouthpiece in it. it. It defies any form of logic that you wouldn't spend. You'll spend <clears throat> months, years, trying to find the ultimate instrument, and just think, oh, this is a here we go. It's more important than the instrument. The yes, the instrument's important. Of course it is. The mouthpiece fitting you. It's the go-between between you and the instrument. So <clears throat> that's just the order of importance uh, as far as equipment is concerned. So I think uh, it, it's really important to look at all of those things when we're trying to work out what's going to fix certain issues. But I guess the two takeaways is I've spoken for a long time <laughs> about two things. Building patches, building your exercises, building your own etudes. Start to learn the skill now. The other is building your Swiss army knife. How do I play where everything works on 40 minutes of the, of the day and I keep the danger at bay, the one that is not going to go. Um, so, <clears throat> there you go. That's what I've just been thinking about, working on in the last month or two. Those things have become uh, quite clear to me, um, as well as cutting a lot of trees down in the chalet and um, realizing how much work I've taken on there and uh, building a recording studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be a dad and a husband and a trombone player. Lots to do. Um, yeah, so podcast coming up on how the brain works when we play from a very amateur perspective. And um, lots of playing stuff. Going to do some recordings. That should be happening in the next two or three weeks. Um, so I better practice. And more videos. Like this, but I'm going to be picking up the trombone. And Anyway, nice to talk to you all again. Hope that was of some use. <laughs>